The fire that started in the back of the submarine was impossible to put out. Even though Captain Bannon had closed off the parts that were on fire, the fire still spread. Even though most of the crew had already reached safety, Vannon and four other crew members stayed to figure out how to save the K-278 Komsomolets, a unique nuclear submarine. After trying to do what they knew would happen, Vannon and the sailors gave up and ran to the escape hatch, but they were still not safe. Because of a flaw in the hatch, it exploded and knocked out all but one of the men. Outside of the submarine, the crew had to deal with something different, the cold waters of the Norwegian Sea. Mission 685 During the Cold War, Soviet engineers built and designed submarines in a way that was different from how Americans did it. The Soviet Navy doctrine said that submarines should be able to outrun and dive deeper than their enemies in quick and deadly underwater dogfights. Because of this, most Soviet submarines were faster, more agile, and stronger than those of the US Navy. The Soviet Union made submarines with double hulls so they could take more damage and dive twice as deep, over 500 meters. Still, they had some problems as well. They made more noise, which made it easy for US Navy submarines to find them. Also, Russian submarines didn't have enough shielding against radiation, which led to a lot of accidents. In the late 1960s, the Soviet Navy tried to fix these problems by putting out requirements for a new submarine that would be used to test fourth-generation submarines. It was called Project 685, and it was meant to test the latest submarine technologies that could combine stealth, maneuverability, and attack mechanisms needed for submarine warfare. The job was given to the Rubin Design Bureau, which came up with a plan for a ship that could carry both conventional and nuclear torpedoes and cruise missiles. Almost 10 years went into making the submarine by Rubin. Even though work on the design started around 1966, it wasn't finished until 1974. The keel of the submarine was laid on April 22, 1978, and it was put into service on June 3, 1983. The name of the submarine was K-278 Komsomolets, which means members of the Komsomol, which is a name for the Young Communist League. She was the only person who was like her. The K-278 Komsomolets took so long to build because she was made entirely of titanium alloy 48T, which is not a common material for submarines. Most submarines are made of steel. The Soviets learned how to work with titanium to keep up with this trend. Even though it was very expensive, it was much stronger and much lighter than steel. The hull of Komsomolets could handle 1,500 psi of pressure from the ocean because it had a double hull with seven compartments. These were the room for the torpedoes, the control room, the electrical motors, the reactor compartment, the turbines, the extra mechanisms, and the room for sleeping. The conning tower had a unique escape pod that let the crew leave the ship safely in case of an emergency. Project 685 moved more than 5,700 tons, and it submerged more than 8,000 tons. She had two SSN-15 Starfish RPK-2 Vioga, two SSN-16 Stallion missiles, six 21-inch torpedo tubes at the bow, and a standard load of 22 torpedoes. One Snoop Head surface search radar and one Shark Gill low-frequency active sonar were the main parts of the submarine. The submarine could go 14 knots on the surface and about 30 knots under the water. Komsomolet's propulsion system was made up of a 190-megawatt OK650B3 pressurized water reactor, two steam turbines, and a seven-blade propeller. She could hold up to 68 people on her crew, which was made up of 32 officers, 21 warrant officers, and 15 enlisted sailors. With enough food and water, the men could stay alive at sea for 50 days. At full power, the submarine could work for about 4,500 hours. Komsomolets were almost 120 meters long, 9 meters deep, and 12 meters wide. Overall, it was a strong ship that would be put to the test soon. After being put into service in June 1983, Komsomolets was tested and tried for four years. In 1984, she was the first military submarine to dive 1,020 meters deep into the Sea of Norway. In April 1989, Captain Yevgeny Vannin sent Komsomolets on her first mission. She was sent on patrol to the southwest of Norway's Bear Island. At 11.03 a.m. on April 7, the submarine was sailing at a depth of 386 meters when high-pressure air hoses connected to the ballast tank suddenly broke their seal. Because of this, the hoses broke an oil container, which caused oil to leak into a hot turbine and start a fire. 
the pressurized air made the fire grow until the nuclear reactor had to shut down quickly. This caused the hydraulics on the consumlets to lose power right away. Captain Bannon closed off the back compartment to stop the fire, but it spread to the other compartments. When the cruise luck ran out, the captain gave the order to blow up the ballast tanks to bring the submarine to the surface. Most of the crew got to the deck, but the captain and five other crew members stayed to try to save the submarine. At 4.30 p.m., as the fire got worse, consumlets began to sink. Vannon and his sailors made it to the escape hatch, but it exploded, killing two crewmen and hurting the other two. Before help arrived, more than 34 of the crew members who were still alive died in the cold waters of Norway. Russia was very upset when Captain Bannon and 41 of the 69 sailors on his ship died. In 1993, a charity was set up to help the families of crew members who died in accidents and the families of sailors who died in similar accidents. After the K-278 Komsomolets and its crew went down in the Barents Sea in April 1989, the wreck site was left alone for a while. As the Soviet Union fell apart, not many people paid attention to the disaster and the effects it had on the environment. Still, in August 1991, Soviet researchers went back to where the huge submarine had sunk to look at the wreck. The experts used manned submersibles to take samples and look at the hull of the submarine. The survivors said that an explosion happened in the bow, where the nuclear torpedoes were kept. This is what the team found. A team of scientists, one of whom was from Norway, went on a second expedition a year later. Since the beginning of 1990, the Scandinavian country had been taking samples and had found high levels of the radioactive substance cesium-137 near the wreck. This second trip tested a lot of organisms, water, and bottom sediments. Scientists tried to lift the submarine, but the damage to the hull made it clear that they couldn't. U.S. Center for the Study of Intelligence CSI, says that a group of Russians, Americans, Dutch, and Norwegians found a huge hole in the forward torpedo compartment in 1993. Even though there was no damage to the hull or too much radiation, it was decided that the corroding torpedoes should be sealed as soon as possible to stop any more leaks. In the middle of 1994, the fourth expedition found that one of the two torpedoes with nuclear weapons was leaking plutonium. Tengiz Borisov, head of the Russian Special Committee for the Conduct of Underwater Work, told reporters, according to the CSI report, that if there is a leak, fishing in the Norwegian Sea will be impossible for 600 to 700 years. On June 24, 1995, the Russian oceanographic research ship Keldish left St. Petersburg for Kamzamalit's resting place to fix the cracks in the hull in the torpedo compartment and cover the nuclear warheads. Even though it wasn't easy, the Russians were able to finish the job by July 1996. A jelly-like sealant kept radiation away from the wreck site for 25 to 30 years, until about 2025. The Norwegian Radiation Agency and the Marine Environmental Agency agreed to check the radiation levels by taking water and soil samples from the wreck site every year. In 1997, the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment put out a study about how the sunk submarine affected the environment. It found that, quote, neither the submarine hull nor the reactor vessel will be destroyed by corrosion for at least 1,000 years. Still, the radiation threat was not over, and there was still more work and research to be done in the area near the wreckage. The Norwegians found that one of the ventilation pipes on the wreck was leaking in 2007. The article Konzamalit's wreck site reveals high radiation levels 30 years after Soviet subsinks by Michael Skalin and Stuart Greer says that in 2019, a joint Russian-Norwegian expedition took five samples and tested them for radiation. The amount of radioactivity in each of them was different. Four of them had contamination levels that were between 30,000 and 100,000 times higher than those found in clean water. The fifth sample was more than 800,000 times above average. Even though the torpedo compartment was sealed, radiation had been leaking out of Kamsamalets the whole time. Hilda Elise Heldell, a researcher at the Institute of Marine Research, said that this was not a reason to worry. She said that pollution doesn't last long and that radiation has never spread more than a meter from the ventilation pipe. Heldell came to the conclusion that even if the submarine leaked a lot of radiation, it wouldn't hurt the fish in the Barents Sea, even in the worst case. This is because the wreck is so deep. She said, I can tell you that fish and seafood from these areas are completely safe to eat because we keep track of radioactive pollution in fish from these areas.
For now, there are no plans to bring the unique Soviet submarine to the surface to stop dangerous radiation leaks. Thanks for watching.